pleased to introduce um, the, the, the featured person in our program is Ambassador Eric Rubin. He's the former U.S. Ambassador to Bulgaria from 2016 to 2019, and he's also currently the president of the American Foreign Service Association, which I think shorthand would be the Union for the Foreign Service Officers. Very important position, um, and as he will be talking about, uh, very powerful in terms of reflecting, I think, the, the, um, the interests and the concerns of our diplomatic corps. So uh, he's been part of the Foreign Service since 1985, and he's been sp he's spent I think it's like 37 years um, advocating for the vital role of diplomacy over what we what many of us view as an exclusive reliance over political and military clout around the world. So please welcome Eric Rubin. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is great to be here. Thanks for that great introduction. It's great to be here at World Affairs. Um, and it's great to see so many uh, old friends and new friends to meet a lot of people I haven't. And I hope we'll have a chance after. Um, but I hope this will be a great discussion. And I know we want to have time for questions. So I'll just start out with saying that and okay, uh, great. look forward to getting going. OK, so we're doing something a little bit different here. Um, I know that I, I gave. Um, uh, the ambassador a little forewarning because I know it's a little bit contradictory or a, a, against the grain for a foreign service officer to uh, to ask an ant to be asked questions and then answer yes or no because they always want to give more nuance okay um, but for for the ambassador here I want to ask you one question first with all that's going on in the world right I mean if nothing else we've learned that um, you know. The world has changed. How many of you are worried about where we are in this country and where we are um, in the world right now? Is anyone not worried? <laughs> okay, good. So we know that people here are very interested and concerned. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do what I call, you've heard of speed dating, right? Well, we're gonna be talking, we're gonna be uh, uh, doing speed questioning. Okay, I've got seven questions, and I want you to answer yes or no. And for the people who will be listening to this, these are not his sole answers, okay? There are probably a lot of nuances that we'll dig in deeper, but you will get a sense right away where he's coming from. And what I'm urging you all to do then is if you hear an answer or a question that you're interested in, File it back, and you can ask a question a little bit later on, either as part of the program or when you see him later. Okay, this is how you can get the panoply of what we're going to be talking about. First question, is America ready for the challenges of the 21st century? Now, yes or no? No. Okay, good. You're, getting, you're, you're doing well, okay? <laughs> um, should we be worried that uh, Vladimir Putin will actually use a nuclear weapon? No. No, okay. Putin's actions have broken geopolitical norms significantly and may require us to re-examine some, some of our pre-existing assumptions. Will Putin's actions influence governments of other countries to act more aggressively, like towards Taiwan or leaders in Iran or North Korea? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. China's a rising power and the US is a declining power. At least that's what a number of people say. And they say that it is only a matter of time before China, before China becomes number one. Agree or disagree? Disagree, no. Okay. Does China and Xi Jinping plan to become number one by 2049, and they are setting themselves up as an alternative to the United States? No. Okay. All right, here's one. Will China invade Taiwan in 10 years? No. Okay. And finally... Do you believe the U.S. Foreign Service as a whole feels frustrated and powerless? Yes. Okay, so now we know where he stands, right? <laughs> okay, so let's start with the last question first because this is something that is your bread and butter every day. All right, so is the U.S. ready for the new challenges of the 21st century? Give us an overview in a sense for you. Let's explain why you say that and at the same time, give us a quick overview probably of the state of diplomacy the way it was 30 years ago and the way it is now. 
So 30 years ago, um, I was involved in helping manage the breakup of the Soviet Union, the what we thought was the end of the Cold War. Uh, and there were a lot of what I would say overly hopeful and easy assumptions that were made at that time. Uh, one of them was the classic assumption that everything was breaking our way. Uh, this was the time uh, not only of George H.W. Bush's New World Order, but Frank Fukuyama's The Last Man and the End of History. Uh, our way was the only way. The whole world was going to have to go that way. And then we came up with this thing called the peace dividend. And the peace dividend basically said, we get to win the greatest struggle since World War II. We get to run the world. Everybody's going to follow our model. And we don't have to pay for it. It's free. And so we went around slashing funding for all the things that helped us win the Cold War, um, briefly including defense, not in the long term, but everything else. Uh, and we now find ourselves essentially with one hand tied behind our back because we haven't got the people and the resources. We're at about one half, 50% in real dollar terms of what we spent on foreign affairs and foreign assistance in 1991 at the end of the Cold War. We cut it in half. And when you cut things in half, there, there's a limit to how much you can, quote, do more with less. No, you can't when you cut it in half. And when you've got a government bureaucracy, there's so many built-in costs that when you cut it in half, you're cutting more than half of your ability to actually do things. So um, that was based on the assumption that you know the world was our oyster and everybody was going to follow us and we had the only good ideas. And jump ahead to now and doesn't look that way. Now, I, as I said, I, I think we still have a lot of strength. And uh, no, I don't think China's going to pass us and other things. But we've got to get our act together. And we've got to pay for our role in the world and our influence in the world. We've got to get our best people out there. We've got to earn the leadership role. We really have been coasting for a long time. And um, I think that's the, the most important thing I would say, which is why I answered no as to whether we're ready for the 21st century's challenges. So I always looked at diplomacy as prevention, right? And defense and actual fighting as trying to, try to you know, sort of uh, the cure it to a certain degree or trying to, cr you know, it's a kinetic action. It's something that you have to do. Give us a sense um, for people, just the scale or the difference between the resources that are given towards diplomatic and, um, I guess, soft power per se, rather than hard power, I guess, would be another way to look at it. So some of you have heard a couple of the anecdotal examples that people cite, but they happen to be true, so I'll, I'll repeat them. You know, one of them is there are actually more musicians in the US military than there are members of the Foreign Service. Um, that's a fact. <laughs> How many people are in the Foreign Service? Uh, we're up at about 20,000 now. Yeah, yeah. And so just, you know, recognizing that, um, our funding is basically a rounding error in terms of the military budget. And we always joke about what we call the 50 colonels syndrome, which is if the White House says we need an interagency task force to tackle X problem, uh, the Pentagon says, well, you know, we can get you 50 colonels and Navy captains tomorrow to, to work on that. And the State Department says, it'll take us a week or two. We can probably find you somebody. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't have any extra people hanging around. Um, you know, if somebody's going to do something, they have to be pulled from something else. Um, so, you know, and this has real consequences. You know, you may have yourselves or friends or relatives who have had trouble getting passports since covid uh, uh, you may know people overseas who can't get an appointment to get a visa to come to the United States. Well, that's because of, of funding, frankly. We don't have the resources, and we made a big mistake uh, in terms of passports and visas in thinking we could fund it all from user fees and not from the federal budget. So we said the people applying for passports and the people applying for visas will just pay for all our staff and all our... And then COVID came, and nobody was traveling, and all of a sudden there were no fees. Well, then how are you going to pay your employees if you, you don't have income? Bad idea. Um, you know, so things like that. And, and I think um, the scale, as you said, Philip, I think, you know, in terms of the militarization of foreign policy, we need a good military. We need a strong military. I don't doubt it for a second. But after 9-11 in Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a sort of militarization of our culture. And I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. which is not important. But they're like, there's military English, which is different from American English. It's its own language. 
And some of it is like quirky and it, it's fine, but you know, they tend to sign letters and memos V slash R, which stands for very respectfully, which means not necessarily respectful, but I'm just writing that. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, tend to call everybody sir and ma'am um, if they're higher rank or even sometimes they're not. You know, we never had that in the Foreign Service until 9-11 and all of that. But, you know, I've spent much of the past 20 years of my career wanting to say to people, please don't call me sir. You know, when I was ambassador, sometimes it was appropriate and I didn't object to it. But, you know, now I'm president of AFSA. Don't call me sir. I have a name, you know, but everybody's come up in this militarized, uh, you know, effect on our, our internal culture. So that's not as important as the disparity in resources and all of that. But so very quickly, and then we'll get to the substance of what we were talking about. But um, there was a sense that the morale within, you know, the State Department and among career, career people throughout the whole federal government during the Trump years just plummeted, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's a sense that things have gotten to have gotten better, but it's not quite what people may think it is, right? It's not quite what they expected. So elaborate on that for us. Sure. So it, it is true that during uh, the Trump administration, um, it was pretty hard. It, it, it's really not good when your, your leaders, your bosses, who happen to have been chosen by the American people or by the people who were chosen, um, you know, basically say to you, um, I don't trust you. I don't like you. Um, you know, I, I think you're disloyal. Uh, I'm going to treat you like the enemy. That's not motivating. That doesn't do well in an organization. If, if you know, anybody here in this room, if your leaders talk to you that way, you know, it's not good. Second of all, a lot of people were forced out, and especially senior people. There was a clear message, we don't want very experienced senior people, career people around, because they tend to talk back. They don't necessarily need an, another job, so they're not afraid, and we don't want that because they're in our face and they're telling us what we're doing wrong and that's really annoying. So let's push as many of them out as we can. And we also lost a lot of our senior diversity that way um, to the point now where we've got a crisis where our senior levels are as white and as male as they've been in 40 years, which is terrible. Um, in some ways it's worse than when I joined 37 years ago. Not the whole foreign service, but the senior levels. Um, so there's that. Then we're understaffed in so many places. You know, If you go to Africa, we have almost not a single embassy that has enough people to do the job properly. We've got a lot of embassies, small embassies, where everybody except the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission, the ambassador's deputy, is brand new, has very little experience. In some cases, we're putting them in charge of budgets and things. It, it's malpractice, but we don't have people. And, um, and that's a, a huge problem. Um, we were just at lunch today. We had the head of the San Francisco Passport Office. And the State Department runs the Passport Office. She's a Foreign Service officer. And she said, look, we've got a backlog of over a million passport applications. Oh gosh, a million. And she said, I just don't have the people to do it any faster. We're trying to catch up. So, you know, who ultimately is this? Well, the administration has to ask for budget. And this is much better than under Trump. I mean, President Trump three times proposed a 30% cut in foreign affairs spending. And in government, a 30% cut is a death sentence. I mean, there's just no possible. Didn't happen. Even the Republicans in Congress gave us more or less equivalent funding to the previous years, but no real increases. We got a little bit last year. Last year, the Biden administration asked for a big increase, and the Democratic Congress cut it back. Um, so when you ask, do, do people feel respected and supported? No, they don't, because they don't see that this is a priority. We also have all these unconfirmed ambassadors waiting for confirmation in the Senate, or you know, some of them need a hearing, and it just doesn't seem to be a priority. Uh, we've had places in the world where we haven't had an ambassador for five years. We are the only country in the world that that could possibly happen with. I can't so imagine. tell us what, that, what the implication of that is from your perspective, and when you're talking to people on the Hill. Sure. So what do ambassadors do? First of all, they represent our country. They represent the president. Our ambassadors are the president's personal representative. Um, second of all, they run our interagency operations overseas. And because they have the president and the Senate behind them, because they're picked by the president and confirmed by the Senate, they've got authority over all the agencies. Uh, and they get a letter from the president that says, you have my, my explicit authority to run all of our operations. Um, third, it's a matter of respect. Um, it used to be ambassadors were sent to kings and emperors and all that between the sovereigns. They exchanged ambassadors. That's still legally what we're doing. 
And when you say to Singapore or Italy or I could go down a long list of countries, we don't even really care if we have an ambassador in your country. Uh, Singapore was five years. Um, were they insulted and angry? Yes. Uh, Italy is going on three and a half years now without an American ambassador. We don't have a nominee. Uh, Italians, the Italian press is writing about this. They're, they're really insulted. And then in some parts of the world, Singapore is an example, the Chinese come along and they say, we don't insult you, do we? We don't leave our ambassadorships vacant, do we? We don't hassle you about human rights, do we? Um, you know, go with us. It's a lot easier and we, we treat you better. So I'm simplifying. But okay, okay. So let's go to some substantive questions now and get to the ones that we also laid out for you. Uh, let's do this on Russia. Big policy issue. You're an ex you know, you've spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe. Um, and so we want to rely on your expertise here. So the big issue, obviously, is Russia-Ukraine. So many wild cards. Um, and in many ways, nothing has gone as expected, right, in, in so many different directions. And, um, but in certain respects, what has grabbed the whole world is Putin's threat of nuclear weapons, which we have not seen in, in, you know, in a generation or so, right? Maybe even two, technically. Um, in addition to him just pushing out all sort of international norms. So what's going on here? Do you, are you worried about this? You're not worried about this? How worried should we be? Well, I, I would join the audience in saying, you know, I'm worried about the state of the world and the dangers, including the danger coming from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, I think what's going on is partly the desperation of a Russian leadership that really is in trouble because they really messed up. Um, they picked a fight with a country they thought would be a pushover. Um, a lot of us who had lived in Ukraine and knew Ukrainian could have told them that it wasn't going to be a pushover, although some of us are actually still pretty impressed and, and even surprised with how tenaciously the Ukrainians have fought and how skillfully. So I think part of it is they're just getting desperate. But the second thing is this is a classic Russian tactic. Remember, Putin is from the KGB. Um, you know, they were not communist per particularly. They were, you know, a certain kind of secret police elite. And this is one of their tactics is you intimidate, you threaten, you scare. It's like a protection racket. It's like, you know, some guy comes to your store and he said, I heard there have been a lot of fires around here. Be a real shame if your store burns down tonight. Um, that's what he's doing. Now, can we rule anything out? No, in, in this world right now, no, anything's possible. I believe that, but is it likely? No. For one thing, the Chinese are already signaling now that that would not be acceptable and Putin needs the Chinese. He doesn't have too many other options. Second of all, I, I think this regime in Russia is finished if they did that. I, I don't right. see any strategy for survival if they use nuclear weapons. Um, so. I think it's in principle an idle threat, but then of course all of us who are students of history know things can go off the rails. You just don't know. Right. So it is worrying, sure. So for people gonna ask, so what's the end game on this? I mean, you know, it, it seems like there is a zero sum situation there, or do you, as a diplomat, right? Um, is, there a, is there a compromise here that can be had, understanding that sometimes it might look bleak at the beginning, but once you start a process, sometimes things can actually happen. What, what's your thinking on this? You know, so as a diplomat and as someone who believes diplomacy is always better than war and conflict and suffering, obviously everybody in my profession wants to see uh, diplomacy over war. Um, however, uh, we're not even close to an end game now and there is not one in sight. And this one has stumped the whole world. You can like go all over the world, including in the US and everything tank and wash. Nobody can tell you how this is gonna end because nobody has a clue. Um, you know, they can say probably no nuclear weapons. They, um, you know, part of the problem is the Russians so overreach. You know, the atrocities that they have committed make it literally impossible for any Ukrainian government to, com to contemplate any kind of territorial compromise. Uh, Zelensky has zero ability to do that, even if we wanted him to, even if he wanted to. The country is so angry, and remember, this is not a small country, it's 40 plus million people. Um, they will not accept it after what the Russians have done. So 
okay, uh, so where does this go? I'm afraid what it probably does is go on into next year at the very least, uh, but I don't see how Putin can survive a significant withdrawal. Okay. So um, sometimes there isn't an obvious answer and we've got to keep looking for it, but right now I do believe the right answer is to do what we're doing and support the Ukrainians because this is about the whole world. We can't have this right. as the new model going forward. Okay. I think people are going to be also interested in, um, and this, I, I know that there's an ambassador that specifically deals with um, hostages and, and de people who are detained, but what's a reasonable expectation of a diplomatic uh, expectation with respect to Brittany Griner? You know, I think, um, I believe, uh, and I want to believe, but I really do believe she'll be home relatively soon. What okay. does relatively soon mean within the next year? Right. Um, uh, we know there's a trade on the table that's not inside information, it's been public. We know that we're holding the merchant of death, Victor Boot, who is KGB and who they really want back, and he has not talked yet after over 10 years in federal prison, but Putin has to worry that at some point he may give up hope and start talking. Mm -hmm. And so Putin wants him back. Um, and um, the problem is there's one other guy who was a, a weapon smuggler, uh, but we don't have a lot more to offer the Russians. We have at least two people we want back, um, probably more given the number of American hostages they've taken. So I think it's gonna drag on. I mean, the fact that uh, the Russians haven't made a deal yet, I think indicates just how bad relations have gotten. And also, this is part of their strategy. They're thinking, well, this is the deal, but if we hold out, maybe they'll sweeten it. Um, yeah. So, as someone who's dealt with North Korea, um, this is something that's sort of par for the course, and it can be incredibly frustrating, but it just really continues a lot of perseverance and ultimately making sure that people don't forget the people, right? Um, and that's what you know, the Foreign Service and the diplomats are making right. sure, so right? Right, so we've been, you know, trying to visit her, but I mean, you know, the, the important thing to understand is we want to believe that everybody in the world at heart is decent and good and cares about other people, but it's not true. Uh, most people are, but uh, the Russian leadership, no, absolutely not. Okay. Switch gears, China. Uh, last 12 months have been very eventful. We had the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. Uh, we had the 20th Congressional Party a year later in which she was elected to an unprecedented third term. And we just had the Xi Biden summit around the G20. Uh, a lot of concerns about China, right? Um, they're, uh, at least in public, much more, at least Xi, much more strident in his public remarks, um, jarring to some people in terms of the language he's used over the last year or so. Um, knowing that China is not your focus all the time, but you're a foreign service officer, so you're a generalist and you can talk about a lot, of, and you have an opinion, I know that for sure. So what do you think came out of the, the summit? And, and then let me just say, where do you think US-China relations are gonna go? Um, and where do you, well, and there's a difference, maybe where they will go and where you hope they, or where they should go. So uh, yes, I'm not a China expert by any means, but China matters to yeah. all of us and to everything. Um, you know, I'm not a believer that China is going to replace us as the world's only superpower, but obviously China is critically important. I think what happened at the summit, which is really welcome and positive, is diplomacy, which is, is basically what the White House said. And it's the start of a dialogue. We've got to be talking to the Chinese. We've got to be working with them. Um, they are, in my mind, I'm not speaking for the administration, they're, they're not our enemy. They are a competitor. They don't share our values. They are a one-party communist dictatorship that suppresses religion and, and suppresses minority ethnic groups. And, you know, no, we're, we, we don't share all the same values. But we need each other, frankly. Um, and, um, and I think this is a recognition, and I hope this leads to an expanded dialogue. I mean, how are we going to solve climate change without China? We're not. Um, so things, there's so many things. So that, that's what I think. So let me ask you then about, um, just pull on the thread of why you don't think they're going to become number one. When you pull that apart, there are two components of any kind of action. One is the capability, right? Is their economic prowess, their, their political prowess, you know, cultural, you know. Uh, um, and then there's intent, okay? So for you, you know, one would be, do you think that's what Xi wants to do? And you said, no. 
And I'd, I'd like to hear about that. And then, but what about their capabilities? Do you think that they, I mean, they certainly have issues, but tell me what you what you think about in so both of those areas. Yeah. Again, I'm not an expert, but yeah. I do talk a lot to yeah. people who are yeah. and who know China, who've lived there for a long time, who study the leadership. I have a friend who who's actually a leadership analyst and has studied Xi at great length. I think they want to be strong and powerful and respected and prosperous. And they want to be treated as uh, the most important country in Asia by far. Uh, and there are issues with India on that, obviously. Um, it's complicated. But I also think that their ambitions are global only in the sense of security and economics it's not a messianic mission that I see. And frankly, to be honest, we have at times, or much of the time, had a messianic mission. We really did have the idea that our way was the best way, and we wanted the whole world to follow it. And we wanted to fight you know, the Soviet Union to oppose their model of civilization and to insist that ours was the right one. I don't think you're seeing that from China. I think China's saying, we're gonna defend our interest, we're gonna defend our security, we're gonna expect respect and deference, frankly, from their neighbors. Um, but they're not saying we want the whole world to be like China and speak Chinese and, and go. It, that, that doesn't seem to me to be their goal. Um, the other thing is we have real disagreements in a couple of things. Their attitude is if you want to have a good relationship, stop criticizing our human rights situation. It's none of your business. And we can't agree to that. Uh, because of our values and our, so how do we navigate that? Uh, through diplomacy, it's how we did it with the Soviet Union. You agree to disagree, you focus on the things you can agree on. I hope we can get back to that with Russia too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we're not anywhere close at the moment, but things like arms control and all that. So, you know, that's I think the, the way forward, but you know, I think we have to acknowledge uh, one reason for our difficulties with China is because we've insisted on things that they just won't accept. Okay, so let me, I mean, you're in Washington, D.C., right? And it's really interesting. When I go to D.C. and I talk with people about China, or for that matter, um, other countries, they always seem to look at, through it through a, a security lens, right? A weapons, you know, it's a weapon, it's a, it's a threat. You come out to other parts of the United States, they don't look at China that way, they don't look at a lot of other countries that way either. It's much more sort of, I think, a little more balanced. So what you're describing is, I think, a rational sort of thoughtful way of looking at the circumstances. But as we know in Washington, that's not always the case sometimes, right? Is there, are you concerned that we may be creating our own enemy, that people are, that the the, the coalition or the center of gravity is looking at China now as a real threat, and then policies are gonna go in that direction? I would say yes, and I'd say, I'd venture to say many, if not most, of my colleagues in diplomacy are as well. Interesting. Um, uh -huh. Because there is this drumbeat in Washington, and it's bipartisan, it's in both parties, not everybody, obviously, that essentially wants to posit China as the enemy and to essentially make this a new Cold War. And um, and I don't think the Chinese see it that way. Um, I can't speak for them, and I'm not, a, again, not an expert, but from what I know, that would be a mistake. And also, again, we have all these global problems that we need to work with the Chinese on. We don't have to like their system. You know, I personally abhor communism. I will never say a single good word about it. Um, I think, you know, they're, they're running a more dictatorial system than they did 10 or 20 years ago. Um, they're oppressing more people. It's not good. And we're never going to completely shut up about that. And we shouldn't because we stand for things. But we got to find a way to manage this relationship. So how is that different then from, I mean, there's some analogs where you said China. I think, you know, with China, I think people also, like you said, w w your description of Russia, right, when they came through that, China was also going to, mirror the West. And eventually those people were way too optimistic and then the argument happens to be now we're way too pessimistic, right? And there's, and Russia is very similar to what, what about Russia right now? I mean, do you, are you worried that they, that Putin still has that or is it purely survival for him, do you think? I think it's beyond survival. I think there is an imperial concept in his mind mm -hmm. and he speaks for much of the Russian elite um, we thought that, you know, the big disappointment for them was not being the other superpower. 
And at the end of the Cold War, we essentially won the Cold War, and that was hard for them. There was some of that. But the real thing that upset the Russian elite and Putin more than many, I think, was the loss of their local empire, the loss of all the territories that they'd effectively conquered, including at the end of World War II. Um, and not just because of, of the humiliation of having to you know, withdraw from all those places, but then, first of all, to see so many of those countries say, we prefer the West, we prefer NATO, we prefer the EU. Um, and second of all, you know, we are no longer gonna uh, show any obeisance, any uh, respect toward Russia. And as a matter of fact, we're still pretty angry about the past thousand years of living next door to Russia. Right. And the Russian attitude is, no, we're, that's not how the world is gonna work around here. Uh, we are you know, the big guy on the block and they've gotta be, so it was more about losing their empire locally in Europe and Eurasia than I think it was about losing the Cold War, but that others might disagree about that. Okay, I wanna get to Taiwan, just one question on Taiwan. I mean, all these, these you know, you, you're all, there are always questions of war and whether it's gonna happen or not. So that's why Taiwan relates to your experience as well. Why are you, why do you feel the way that you feel that it's very unlikely? So, you know, nothing is impossible. Right. But Understood. if you're looking at goals and objectives and how to achieve them, um, and that doesn't just include taking over Taiwan, which the Chinese have told us they wanna do, but also being a, a very important power in the world, economically, politically, and all that, I think a war in Taiwan just doesn't make sense when there's so many other ways that they can increasingly pursue their objective. Um, the other thing is I think you're seeing a, an element of what the Russians have done and what Putin has done, which is essentially trying to intimidate. Remember, the Chinese leadership is a communist leadership. I think if you ask Xi Jinping, have you studied Lenin and Stalin, he would say, of course I have. Um, that's who they are. They're, they're communists, unlike Putin, actually. Look at the flag. So, um, you know, they're intimidating. They're saying, uh, you know, we'd hate to have to invade Taiwan, but we might have to if you don't give us what we want. And they're thinking, well, you know, the last thing the United States and its allies want is war in the South China Sea, so they'll, you know, mm -hmm. make concessions to us and all that. Uh, but am I 100% sure of that? No, of course not. You can't be 100% sure of anything sure. right now. Sure. Um, Okay, let's then start going, let's go circle back then to the Foreign Service, America, where we go, what do we do now? Um, in your mind, what does the future of U.S. foreign policy look like, and what does the Foreign Service look like? So, um, in terms of the Foreign Service, let's start with that. Yep. I think our key point is not just that we need more resources and staffing, but we need to get back to the idea, which is in the Foreign Service Act of 1980, which is our founding legislation, that career experienced professionals are at the heart of our foreign policy establishment. They work together with political appointees uh, to help advise our policymakers and to shape the policy and this, to tee up decisions for our policymakers. And if you take that out of the equation and you only have people who are either amateurs or who don't have a lot of that deep experience, you're really gonna be handicapping our ability to, to succeed in this world. Um, I do believe there has been a bipartisan drift away from including and respecting career professionals, not just in diplomacy, but in other fields as well. You know, we saw some of this with Dr. Fauci and, and COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the famous line in Britain during the Brexit referendum was uh, British people are sick and tired of listening to experts. Um, that was the line. Um, you know, I think to some extent we have a little bit of that. And I'm not saying experts are always right and some of them are definitely wrong. But people who devote their lives to public service and to develop great expertise, um, you know, are needed and the politicians need to include them. The famous story that was told during the Vietnam War, we had an undersecretary of state named George Ball who was a vehement opponent of the Vietnam War. And every week when they had the National Security Council meetings at the White House, he was invited to join the Secretary of State. And every week, President Kennedy and President Johnson said, and George, what do you think? And George said, as you know, Mr. President, I think this is a huge mistake. I think we're getting in deeper. We gotta get out. There's no chance of success. And the President said, thank you very much. Um, but they kept inviting him back because he spoke from a position of experience and knowledge and they respected that. 
So that doesn't happen too much now. Um, and so I think there's that. The second thing is just making the career a little easier. One of our jobs is to try to eliminate all the frustrations and the, uh, the stuff that just makes it hard in, in 2022 for modern employees, modern families to do this job. The bureaucracy keeps getting worse. Um, so give us some concrete examples. So for example, um, we had a terrible thing. In the middle of COVID, uh, there was a case of rabies coming out of Azerbaijan and the CDC, which should have been focused on COVID, said, um, that's it, uh, no more dogs can come into the United States from any country except the EU and Japan and Canada and Australia or something like that, but you know, just a few of the most of them. And so we, and actually our colleagues at the Defense Department said, what about US service people and diplomats and aid workers who have their pets overseas? Are you saying they can't bring their dogs back? And the answer was, well, they can, but only if they jump through the following hoops and it'll take five months and they have to send a blood sample by FedEx to a lab in Chattanooga from you know, Kyrgyzstan or whatever. It was basically impossible. So we, we fought and we won a whole lot of exceptions. It's still officially in place, but you know, people start to think, I can't even bring my dog back when I'm serving overseas. Um, really in terms of family employment, you know, it's really hard for two career couples. So that's, that's an issue. Um, and then, you know, the other thing, COVID, which was not unique at all to the foreign service, but you know, people, a lot of people had to evacuate, families were separated. Um, there's a lot of fear. You know, people say, oh, well, I was, you know, scared in the Bay Area. Well, okay, you had reason to be, but if you were in Ouagadougou or, or Dili, East Timor or whatever, you can be more scared. There's no decent hospitals. Most of the flights shut down. So things like that, and there's a lot more. Um, we had a payroll mess at the State Department in the past two years where people weren't getting paid and they weren't getting their uh, allowances and their money going to their retirement account got lost. And, and it was a total mess, which is gradually being... But, People sometimes say enough. I just, you know, I want to serve my country. I want to do this, but it, it, you know, I don't get a lot of respect, and I don't. Um, so that's our agenda. We're working really hard. We have solved some issues um, right here in California. Uh, we got the Congress to pass last year something called the Foreign Service Families Act, and one of the things it says is people have the right to go to colleges and universities or send their kids to college and universities in their home state of domicile within state tuition. Yeah. So if you join the Foreign Service and you're from California and you stay registered in California, you have the right to send your kids within state tuition. Uh, the UC system was mostly saying no to our people. Uh, not always, but we had to fight every single case. Uh, now we got a law, and matter of fact, I'm gonna be at UC Davis tomorrow and I'm gonna be meeting the Vice Provost and I'm gonna say, by the way, the, you know about this law, right? We're gonna insist now. Yeah. Um, we even had you know, enlisted Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, who's an old friend, and she tried to help, but UC was just you know, yeah. firm that you don't live here anymore. Well, we don't live here anymore because we're serving our country. Um, you know. So anyway, things like that, which are important because people say you know, it's one thing after another. So. There's that, and then the last thing I would say is, is, you know, there's so many big places like China and Russia where our diplomatic um, relations have deteriorated so dramatically, and so for people who you know specialize in those big relationships, it you know it's getting harder. So right now with the lockdowns in China, yeah, um, you know people can't serve a normal assignment in China right now, even if that's their passion and what they want to do. So it's it's been a hard time, but you know we. We keep pushing. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so we have time for questions from the audience. We have a microphone. Normally, we have something to write, but we're also changing that format. So um, if people have questions, please, please feel free to ask. Um, and Ambassador Rubin, questions? Got to be questions, right? Somebody start. Yes. There we go. Patrick Badan, Tiburon, FinTech entrepreneur. That's enough. Yeah. Uh, um, War in Ukraine is a European war. I'm originally from France. Uh, so are we, are we extracting our pound of flesh from the Europeans, or should we be extracting it for them to get their act together and be a power that they should be? Uh, I know France was very proud to send 18 cannons since the war started. I mean, that doesn't do much, I don't think. 
Thanks. I mean, this is a set of issues that I've been dealing with my whole career. We used to call it burden sharing during the Cold War. Um, it's a fact that our European allies have historically mostly not done their share and not done enough, but it's been exaggerated by some politicians and even some presidents. Um, you know, the story is nuanced and complicated. Um, that said, you know, when you have a situation where the German military can't, you know, have half of their ships and submarines go to sea and half of their tanks are inoperable and, and things like that, no, it's not good and it's not okay and they can afford to do better. But I will say this has been a success story. I really will speak up for, for that. Um, no, they're not doing as much in terms of military assistance, but, you know, the Brits and the Canadians are doing a lot. Uh, and, um, you know, some of the other countries, I, I won't name other countries, but they certainly could do more. On the other hand, you know, we've got real changes in Europe. Um, you know, the idea that Western Europe basically just said we're, we're going to have to get rid of Russian energy, um, whether we like it or not, and we're going to have to accept that we're not going to be able to have you know, a normal relationship with Russia. And the fact that European publics are mostly not saying, you got to get us back our cheap Russian gas. They're saying these atrocities are horrific to the point where even politicians who want to be sympathetic to Russia are finding the public not sympathetic. So, you know, and, and some of this is skillful diplomacy by the United States. I really think we do need to give credit to our leaders um, and not just the president, but the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense and others. But, you know, the big question you're asking, um, I think at the end of the day, you know, the Western Europeans only spent money after World War II on the Cold War because they were afraid of being conquered by the Soviet Union. And they really didn't want that. And once that went away, they said, you know, after World War I and World War II, we really, really don't want to do the military thing. And the problem is you can't be a world leader and not take it seriously. And, and so your point, of course, is correct. But then the other thing to say is, you know, we have a lot of asks for the Europeans on sanctions and all sorts of stuff. So I would say we're making progress. But, you know, again, we're no longer the only game in town. So, you know, if President Biden calls President Macron and says, here's my list of 10 things you have to do tomorrow, I, I think the answer will not necessarily be friendly. Um, you know, they're not taking orders. Uh, so we've got to persuade and conjole. Um, and then they'll say, turning back, well, are you sure you're going to keep support in the United States for this policy? And we say, well, we're trying hard to do it. So far, so good. And they're like, that's not good enough. What's the future look like? So this is a dialogue. Um, but I would say this has been a, a tragic year in so many ways. But in terms of alliance, unity, uh, restored relevance for NATO, increased funding for defense, uh, I think it's been positive in a lot of respects. Okay. Other questions? One right here. Um, so in class, we've done assignments hypothesizing about how we might, um, you know, how the war in Ukraine might end or how we might respond to the usage of an atomic weapon. Um, what I want to ask you, though, about is after. What do you see Ukraine's status being after the war? If the Ukrainians are successful, are we looking at another Israel, or will and will Russia be eager to try and invade again? Your name? Uh, Tazu. Tazu, welcome. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, we don't know. <laughs> and nobody knows. If you find a brilliant analyst who's figured it all out, let me know who that is, because I, I want to talk to that person. We, we just don't know. I, I think... It is pretty apparent to me that Russia cannot conquer Ukraine. Um, can it continue to just wreck it and destroy it? Yes, um, but only up to a point because they're actually running out of missiles. One of the reasons we're having these missiles landing in all sorts of places is they're using really old stuff that's completely inaccurate that can't really be targeted because they run out of all their precision guide, guided munitions and they can't make more without our technology. Globalization affected the Russian war machine as well. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think ideally you would have a situation where, um, you know, basically both sides said we can compromise. But again, you know, the Russians have said Ukraine doesn't exist, doesn't deserve to exist. There's no Ukrainian language. There's no Ukrainian people. It's all part of the Russian world. So what are the Ukrainians supposed to do with that? 
Um, and if there were, a, you know, a lot of Ukrainians who are sympathetic to Russia anymore, the Russians could play on that, but there aren't. Uh, the Russians have ensured that, that they've got almost no support from anyone in Ukraine now. So that blocks, you know, that, that so I think um, the real answer is we're not going to know through the winter and into next year. I think there will be efforts at diplomacy, but uh, Putin has put himself in a corner. Um, you know, we never know what could happen in Russia. Putin could not be here tomorrow. Um, it could happen for whatever reason or not, or he could be there for another 20 years. So gaming this out is important. It's something I know that our government is doing, our military is doing, but um, it's terra incognita. And the same thing, were there to be use of a nuclear weapon, which as I said, I, I don't believe is likely. Uh, do we know what we would do? No, we don't. We don't really have a plan for that. We have a plan if somebody attacks the United States with nuclear weapons. We've got a lot of plans. We've had them for 75 years. But if one country attacks another with nuclear weapons, do we have a plan for that? Not, not much to my knowledge. Okay, I got the high sign. So let me ask the last question on this. Um, so first of all, everyone ignore this right here, conversations that matter, okay? We're, we're changing that. Um, the new, the thing that we're gonna be, you'll be hearing about is this notion of connect, learn, and act. Okay, so that is sort of how we're gonna go forward. So you have all experienced a connection here, right, at the beginning. And truly, I hope that you will continue to come back and see the person that you just met, the people that you will continue to meet while you're here, because I want all of you to believe that this is part of, for the community. That's what World Affairs is for, first. Second thing, you've all learned an incredible amount while we've been here in this 45 minutes or so talking with Ambassador Rubens. Thank you. Now the most important component, and I think is new for what we're trying to do here at World Affairs, is because it's not simply about talking, it's about doing things. And the one thing that I do know about foreign service officers um, and people in government is that process is important, but operations and doing something is absolutely critical. So the last question I have for you, we have a lot of young people here. We have other people here who all want to do something because they're worried about the state of our world. And so what we're trying to do is facilitate that, curate that for folks. So I want to ask you, what can people do? What can young people here do who have done, you said we had hope, great hope you did, okay? We have a number of other people who are here because they believe that something can be done. That's why they're here. What would you suggest? Well, first of all, I totally agree with the new slogan, and I really agree with the idea that everybody can do something. And yes, it matters at the end of the day. Um, you know, if I were starting out again in high school or in college, um, I would follow my interests and my, my dreams, but I would say to myself, I wanna make a difference. I did say that really when I joined this career in 1985. And um, I wanna make things better. Um, and part of that is, is serving our country, but part of that is actually contributing to diplomacy and conflict resolution. So I would, the fact that, you know, the, the students who are here are here is because they have self-selected and expressed their interest and applied for the program. Please keep doing that. And, um, you know, focus on, if, you, if you're fascinated by this, then, you know, we need you. And, you know, keep going. Obviously, you know, if you're a high school student, you should go to college. Um, uh, but you should keep this in mind. And I've already talked about internships and other things where you can get involved right now or, or next year or something. And then for you know people who are college graduates and, and others in the audience, I would say, um, you know, first of all, politics matters. So it's really important that you know our Congress, which sets our budgets, hear from the American people uh, that they care about our role in the world, they care about diplomacy, they care about um, making sure that, that we have the resources to, to do what we need to do to secure diplomacy, to secure our country's future. Um, so obviously, you know, we've just been through a midterm election, uh, but, but this matters. Um, the second piece is, is do something. So do little things. Uh, you know, the Ukrainian people are in a terrible spot place, but they'd be so much worse off if there weren't all these people around the world who are helping and who are doing stuff. Concrete assistance, it's not just money, 
Um, you know, if you look what happened, you know, this is the greatest refugee crisis, uh, certainly in Europe, but there haven't been too many this big, maybe since Indian partition. And you look what happened, the, Poland just said, yeah, we can take seven million people. Now some people say, yeah, well, it helps that they're the same race, mostly in the same Christian religion, mostly, and whatever, but that wasn't what it was about, really. Uh, but Poland just said, yep, we'll do it. And they've taken you know, basically seven million people. And there are all sorts of people in Poland doing all sorts of stuff to help people. Here, people you know, are working to send ambulances, and we've got doctors volunteering to go there to help the combat wounded. Um, you know, but speaking out and, and getting involved. So you know, that would be that, you know, saying, don't be worried, don't be anxious. Well, that's not going to work right now. It doesn't work for me. But you know, the best antidote to that, I think, is to, to do something and to feel like it's not hopeless and we can do things and make things better, which I do believe. Um, but um, what it is is really you know, what you can do and what you, you're interested in doing. Uh, but, um, but it's been, in a way, this, this horrible Ukrainian crisis. Uh, I have found, I mean, I found it devastating emotionally. I've lived there, we have said it, 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 it's hard to comprehend. But I found it inspiring. Uh, all the people who've stood up and you know gone to help Ukraine, but also to stand up for our values and principles. Uh, and I, I really have found that heartening and inspiring. So um, you know, out of terrible times, maybe can come some good things as well. Okay, with that, we're going to close the program. Ambassador Eric Rubin, thank you so much. Everyone, please applaud. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Greatly appreciated, especially our young people who came a little bit earlier. I, you know, I know that you had to. It's uh, some for some of you quite a trek. Um, wanted a big thank you to the Japan Society of Northern California and the uh, American Foreign Service Association of Northern California. Thank you very much for being our partners on this. Greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, again, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, stay tuned for other things that we're doing. Become a member. Please, right? Um, there's a lot more stuff that's going to be coming about. And I think the things that you're talking about in terms of what people can do and helping refugees and getting people settled, there are going to be opportunities for people to get involved with that. And then finally, once again, we have refreshments, right, Joy? Over there. So please um, go to there, enjoy refreshments. We have a lot of food. I don't want to have our people take it home because it, we don't have much storage. Um, so please go. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.